Hello, everyone. I want to talk today about uh, using code to create um, visuals. So, um, first of all, my normal job is being a graphic designer and creative planner. And um, why I really like doing this kind of job, it's for me quite often about um, just solving problems. That's pro basically the job of a graphic designer. And why this is fine, sometimes it can be a little bit tiring and in similar time periods you solve similar problems. So I always had um, this idea of doing some work that is more free. And probably since I discovered the book Generative Design by Onformative, this idea of using code to create something visual was very big in my head. And the visuals I've seen in this book, I've never seen something similar before. Somewhere in the beginning of last year, I decided that I really want to take some um, time aside and just focus on learning something new and discovering something new where there's no real right and wrong, where there's no real project, but just learning something new and doing it. So um, I applied at the School for Poetic Computation in New York and I got accepted and I went there and learned a lot of interesting things. And to, to start this, um, I want to show some examples from the past because as, as I told you, at the beginning I thought like this idea of using technology to create art is something very new. And, but later I learned that there were so many interesting work from the past, for example the work of John Whitney. He started to make these very mass-inspired animations and he did this somewhere in the 50s and actually he built um, mechanical machines to make these animations. This was before there were computers. Obviously, later he um, started using uh, computers as well. But then there's also this interesting story from the movie Vertigo. So he worked with the graphic designer Saul Bass, who was like the main designer for this movie. And the designer had this idea of using these kinds of figures. These are called Lissajou figures. These are basically complex mass um, equations that you can draw out in a graph like this. These, this concept is pretty old, but it was pretty difficult to draw these figures, actually. So um, what then John Whitney did is he needed to come up with a solution on how to draw these figures. And he made something pretty interesting. He took an old World War II military machine. You can see it on the right here. It's called the uh, M5 Gun Director. This was a machine they used to aim cannons on moving targets. And this was not used anymore, and there was a complex machine several people need to, to operate at the same time. But he repurposed this machine. I really like this idea of taking something and using it for something else to create something new. And then another example which I really like is the Hungarian artist Vera Molnar. She was born in 1924. She, at the beginning, she always drew like very abstract geometric paintings. And by the time when computer became more accessible to people, somewhere in the mid-60s, she started to experiment actually with code. So the first computer she probably used probably looked something like this. And she turned her um, geometric approach into um, computer algorithms, so writing code for her to then execute these kinds of drawings. And for a lot of her work, she used then actually a pen plotter which you can see on the right, which was used to create like, like graphs, um, and she used it to create her art. And then in the mid-60s, this is when she then actually started using code and create um, images like these, paintings like these. These were completely made by computer. She created algorithms, and then the computer made these interesting uh, drawings out of it. Um, another example which I really like is um, made by um, Woody Vazolka and Brian O'Reilly. And what they actually did, just with this project here, they manipulated the way an old TV works, an old CRT TV, these giant big television sets, um, with a machine called a scan processor. And they could actually manipulate the way this TV functions to then create these completely abstract figures that go from, from geometric to almost like horror-like movie. Um, just by manipulating the hardware. And um, yeah, for me, when I look at these examples, I think it's so, so interesting to, to take something that, that's existing, like John Whitney, and repurpose it for something else. Or like Vera Molnar, when there's a new technology, really see what can you actually do with this new technology when it comes to artistic expression. 
And now I want to show you some um, examples how I approach using code to, to make some visuals. But first, I wanted to show you, like, a, I don't know if you're all familiar with using code, so I wanted to show you like a super simple example how it feels to do something in code. So um, this here is the text editor. It's p5.js on the left, and on the right you have an output. And p5.js and processing and um, open frameworks, they always work like this. You have a setup area. This is all the code in there will be executed once. And then you have a draw area. All the code in there will be executed every frame of animation, meaning 16 times a second by default. And um, that's your interface, which is a bit weird at the beginning. Um, but if you, want to, if you want to, for example, have a rectangle on, this, uh, on the screen, there are functions to do this. Um, you can say uh, rect, which means rectangle, give it an x position, a y position, and the width and a height. And if you hit save, you have a rectangle. Um, super exciting so far. If you want to move um, a rectangle, you need to use some mass, but you can do like, basic calculations. For this, we want to um, create a variable, and we call it xpos, for example, for x-position. We need to initialize it. I don't see the animations here, that's why I need to look there. And give an initial value of zero. And then we can do calculation here, saying like x-position, every frame make x-position five pixel bigger. Then we use x-position here. And then we hit save. And it was a lot of work for making a moving square. But this is basically how it works if you want to make uh, visuals and code. So um, what I realized um, after a while is when, when you are more or less new to code, um, code can become very complicated. On the other hand, I also learned that it's so interesting if you take a very small idea into code and see how you can what else you can make out of the simple idea. Because if you take a simple idea, it can become bigger than you actually thought. For me personally, this is also very interesting because I actually really love the old graphic design um, from Switzerland from the 50s and 60s with this simplistic, puristic approach. And you can bring ideas like this into code and see what else you can do there. For a first example, I want to show you um, I took something very simple. I, I took a circle and asked myself, what could I do with a circle? And um, I, I realized the circle is basically, you can make a circle out of four identical shapes, quarter circles. If you take these circles and just change the rotation, you have four different rotations and you have four different positions. That's basically everything there is to, to making a circle out of quarter circles. If you do this, you end up with like a permutation. You end up with 4 to the power of 4, which is 256 combination. It reminded me a little bit about art assignments when you take like a very simple task and need to do as many um, variations as possible. But here you can bring something like this into code and let the computer make the work for you, do all of the variations. So. Um, here on the next example, you see the numbers on the top, and these numbers are actually numbers I'm using to control the variation. So we have four different rotations, so 0, 1, 2, 3. And these numbers on the top represent all of the rotations from the quarter circle. So if I hit play here, um, you see the permutation is starting. It's always changing the last one, and, and if the last one has made all variation, then the next one is changing. Um, this concept is basically the same concept how you would um, crack a combination lock on a bike or whatever. It's the same concept. And if you wait for a while, we have seen now all possible variations you could do with a circle composed out of four quarter circles. To make this more interesting, I, I, I um, wanted to put these circles into um, into a grid. Or I created a function there which always divides the grid in half. And when it's finished dividing the grid in half, it's doing this again. And if you are not carefully, it will do this over and over again until your computer crashes. So by this, you can create um, a system for a grid which builds itself and where you don't need to plan out everything, where you can be surprised by what will happen. The next example you see um, on the top right, there's a threshold. So I'm always calculating a number between a random number between 0 and 1. <coughs> and I say if the random number is at zero, uh, at one, at the threshold, then reduce the grid again. 
And so if, if I'm doing this now, if I'm letting it play, it's not reducing it because the chance is to create a, number, a random number that is one is very low. But no, now you see I'm going down with the threshold and the further down I go, the more often you will see a smaller grid where things get smaller at the end. So now we're at a five and it gets smaller and smaller more often and more often. Now we're at two. And now you, you end up just having a super small grid here. I could make it even smaller, but it would probably crash my computer. And for me, the, the, the interesting thing is you, if you take a simple idea like this and try to bring it into a logical structure and then try to work with it, you start to discover things um, that were not really planned out, but you laid the groundwork for them. So it's interesting for discovery, turn a circle into probably many circles, of course, but also maybe it's, it's, it's a pattern like on the right, which looks a little bit like clouds in the comic, where then like these shapes start to, uh, to connect. Or maybe you get a pattern that looks a little bit like a um, 50s wallpaper with some digital glitch in it, or you start to see some letters from the alphabet. So taking a simple idea and then see what will happen there is pretty interesting when you use code. Um, another example is I found this um, graphic. I actually don't know who made it or where it is from, but I thought this would be interesting to try to make, make interactive and put it into code. And as you can see, like in the middle, there's this perfect square. And if you move on the x-axis, left or right, then you see like the width gets less. If you move on the y-axis, the height gets less. So this design actually felt for me al almost like computer made. If you try to bring this into code, the cool thing is about coding things is that you don't actually need to animate stuff. You can um, make things intelligent so that they will react on interaction. So the yellow thing is the mouse, by the way. So this rectangle always knows where the mouse is, always know wh where it is itself, and then changes its size depending on it. If you take exactly the same code snippet and put it into a grid, you get something which is pretty much the same that we have saw in this, in this graphic. And to make this, it, it took a while, um, but the interesting thing is once you made everything very logical and that everything is depending on everything, that you don't make any hard-coded decisions there, um, it's interesting to just then explore what else you can do. And by just changing the way how fast elements react, you get completely new aesthetics there, looking like, I don't know, reflections on the water, or, or even changing more the size of um, how things scale. Yeah, so exploring simple ideas. And another thing I wanted to show to you um, and make a small demo is I found this old animation by John Whitney, and I just liked it because it was so simple, and I wanted to rebuild it. And um, you would probably say you can rebuild this when you use 3D in about, I don't know, 10 minutes if you can do it. But I was just introduced to this concept of um, using sine waves to use this for animation. So a sine wave is something you can create in code and it always creates this oscillation between two states, this smooth oscillation. Yeah, I tried to rebuild his wave um, in, in, in open frameworks and then only animate it using different sine waves. I wanted to demo this, uh, this animation instead of um, showing a video. I hope this is a good idea. Um, so let's check. Yeah, so I made this um, little controller here for the iPhone. We have five variables which I can control. So the basics is I can change how many um, columns I'm having. I can change how many rows I have in my basic shape. And then I can start to slightly introduce the sine wave to create um, a scaling. Everything is scaling at the same time, but I ca then can offset the scale of the sine wave so that every column is scaling at a different time. So, and then I'm starting to get something that pretty much looks like what we have seen with John Whitney. And then I can change the shape, make it bigger, and something else will happen. And then I can also um, introduce like a second sine wave to control the exposition, for example, and do a starting to get completely new shapes, something like this. Yeah, so um, I can get pretty lost in doing things like this. It's pretty, it's like self, <laughs> self. <laughs> Thank you. Um. 
Yeah, and, and everything you've seen there was just like changing four variables and having a code where everything is depending on everything. And then you can start explore and find completely new shapes. Yeah, so this is a different, very, very small example, but I also think it's very interesting to take like super basic um, graphic design pattern, uh, like uh, uh, ideas and turn it into something animated. Just this idea of rhythm we have in graphic design, take the same shape and position this shape in a certain rhythm on the page. So what I've, what I've done here is, that's the basic animation I'm doing, just morphing the same uh, cube back and forth all the time. That's everything I'm doing. And then I'm creating 50 copies of it and slightly change um, the, the timing between all of these copies. Yeah, you, you can explore things like this. Um, <laughs> Um, something, something else I made at the um, end of my time in New York at SFPC. Um, it was actually turned out to be a bit more complicated than I wanted it to be. Yeah, I think some, sometimes in the times we are living right now, everything is somewhere digital. Everything is stored forever. And uh, sometimes thing do, things do feel a little bit unpersonal and maybe cold. So I wanted to create something which only lives in the moment and will be gone afterwards. So I had this idea of building this machine or this installation, which was like a keyboard and a display, where you could actually talk to and, and say something to it. But the idea there was it was just in a moment. Once the people are typing and interacting, the typeface was constantly changing. But when they stopped typing, it just went back to its ordinary state. I, s I started first designing um, a basic monospace, um, monoline typeface, and, but I needed to bring it into code. I couldn't use um, a ready-made typeface because I needed all of the position from all of the points and stuff. So I, I tried to design everything relative based on the grid, so I knew exactly my main container is this size and then my points need to be here. To give me more control over this, I needed to do this parametrically, so I thought about what could be like var variables for a type. So I brought all of this into code and gave them um, categories so that I could then later decide in code, now take all the, the horizontal and do this, now take all the verticals and do this. And, um, and then I was just thinking about some, what, what could I do there? Made some experiments, like different widths maybe, and maybe second strokes, for example, thicker strokes, weird broken things. When it comes to exploring things you do in code, for me here it was a little bit different um, because this project, at the end, about two days before the exhibition, everything was completely broke, nothing was working anymore, and I had to do it like in two nights all over again. But um, while having this ex exhibition, I realized um, it was, it was worth it because the thing is, like, people they were so curious, they had no idea how this works. So they were there typing all the time and then retyping words and see if it's going to be the, the same, but it's always going to be, uh, it was always different. Some people really wrote something very interesting. Some people just, like, made, like, random letters but were completely hypnotized. And, um, yeah, so this, this, this idea when you do something like this and then let other people um, experience it, it's also very educational for yourself to understand what you actually did there. Like as, as the last part, um, just a few thoughts I had um, after a while when I was using code for a while. Um, I started with the book Generative Design. This was for me the thing. I thought this is the type of work you're going to do then if you use code. But actually I realized there are actually no real genres because um, you can recreate almost everything if you use code. I want to show you some interesting product, uh, projects from people I met in the, in the school who were professors there. And one project is, it was called Doty, the dot matrix fabric printer by Pamela Liu. What she actually made, she made a software where she could drag and drop a pixel image. And then the software would create like a weaving pattern based on this pixel image. And then additionally to this, she actually also built the hardware to actually make the weaving work. So she took like the approach of using code to build something completely different. Like Alison Parrish, she is a professor at NYU. She's doing crazy work using poetry and using words. And for example, what, sh what she made, she did a lot of work with the phonetics of words, so how words actually sound. If you think about the words you see on the left, like inky and kinky, they have a similar sound to them. 
or octopus and a couple lips. They have a similar sound to them, but there's no system for something like this. So what she actually made, she made this giant multidimensional space where she positioned all of the English words according to their phonetic similarities. And by doing this, um, she's doing all kinds of work, but like this on the left, for example, she takes two sentences and gradually blends the sounds of the sentences together. So I, I'm reading just three lines, but it starts with, I am sitting in a room, different room from the one you are in now. A few lines later, I am sitting in a room, different room, the one you are in now. And later it's just humming, 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 humming. Another person who's doing great work is Robbie Kraft. He was also a teacher there. And he, he's doing origami, and she, he's doing this since 10 years, and he's doing incredible origami work anyways. But he then started to use code for him to help him develop these crease patterns, which are pretty difficult. You cannot fold everything. So he used his coding skills to, at the end, do something with paper. The main thing which excites me about using code to do something artistic is at a certain point, I realized if you are a designer or artist, the kind of output is always determined by the tools you're using. So if we're all using the same tools, we will always have a similar output. Of course, there will be variation and stuff. But if we create some complete new tools, we can probably go to complete new output we've never thought about before. And to end this, I just want to read a quote from Vera Molnar, which I re really like. She said, I used the computer to combine forms, hoping that this tool will enable me to distance myself from what I've learned, from my cultural heritage, from everything that surrounds me, in brief, from the influences of society. And uh, that's it. It was quick. <laughs> Thank you.